Good evening. Good evening. There we go. My name is Charles Davis. I am an assistant professor and currently serve as the chief strategy officer at the USC Race and Equity Center. I have the distinguished honor and ple uh, pleasure and privilege to introduce tonight's keynote speaker. On October 26, 1975, Vashon Ramon Harper, yes, I said your full name. <laughs> your mama gave it to you, so I'm going to say it in public. Vashon Ramon Harper was born to a 16-year-old mother in Thomasville, Georgia. It was in this de facto segregated southern town where this curious black boy first took note of the racial inequities experienced by and the recurring disrespect of working class black families. And thus the labor in the name of justice began. In 1994, he graduated from Thomasville High School and ventured 60 miles north to the small city of Albany, Georgia. There he enrolled in the historically black Albany State University, where the foundation for the future post-secondary excellence was laid. Now, of course, I could tell you that he was a standout college student. I could tell you that he was not only excelling in the classroom, but doing so while also in the ASU Marching Rams drumline. I could also tell you that he was the editor-in-chief of the Student Voices Campus newspaper, the member of multiple honor societies, and the president of the Student Government Association to boot. But I'd much rather tell you simply that there's a scholar in town I could also tell you that he was scholar number eight on the spring 1998 line of those pretty boy noops. <laughs> the Albany State University chapter, the Delta Z of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated, an organization of which he is now a life member. But I'd much rather tell you people that there is a scholar in town. And so after graduating in the same year with a Bachelor of Science in Education, Sean then went to Bloomington to attend Indiana University, the birthplace of our beloved fraternity. Shout out IU, IU in the building? Okay, 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 okay. Y'all got next year too, okay? We're gonna just, a little bit at a time. And so it was there at the Indiana University where he pursued a master's degree in college student affairs and later a doctor of philosophy in higher education. It was at Indiana he began his career in student affairs where he worked in Greek life and later as an administrator at IU's Kelly School of Business. Upon graduating, the newly minted Dr. Harper became the inaugural, in 2003, the executive director of the Doctor of Education program at the Ross Sears School of Education at USC, where he also served as an assistant professor. And then in 2005, he would depart for Penn State, where he would begin on the tenure track. At Pennsylvania State University, he was also a research associate in the Center for the Study of Higher Education. And only two years later, he departed Penn State for the University of Pennsylvania Graduate School of Education where he would become a tenured faculty member and also the founding executive director of the Center for the Study of Race and Equity in Education. Penn would later promote him to the rank of full professor in 2016. But if you know anything about Sean, that that was not gonna be enough. And so in 2017, as an avid lover of the West Coast, he had then returned to USC, where it all began. Having since published 12 books, more than 100 peer-reviewed journal articles and other scholarly publications, received multiple scholarly awards from ASH, AERA, NASPA, ACPA, an honorary doctorate, because you know you gotta get the doctorate's doctorate after the master's masters. <laughs> and recognition by Ed Week as one of the 10 most influential education professors in the country. And so certainly his return to USC was a decorative one. Just recently, Sean was installed as the Clifford and Betty Allen Professor, Chair of Urban Leadership, also a provost professor with joint appointments in the Ross Sears School of Education and the Marshall School of Business. He also now is the founding executive director of what is we call the USC Race and Equity Center. And so I tell you all this, but again, I could just tell you that there is a scholar in town. And so for me, as someone who's known Sean and done this work for some time, I just simply think of him as Sean, affectionately known as Harp, and sometimes DJ Sharper One, spinning the best of hip hop and R&B from the 90s, 2000s, and today. <laughs> and again, while so many of us here in the association, when we see Dr. Harper, we know that the bar of academic achievement is set high. But it is none higher than the bar that he sets for me and for so many of you as a friend, as a confidant, as a co-conspirator and accomplice, as a frat brother, as a homeboy, and for Sean Hill, a loving and committed husband. Having known and worked with and collaborated with Sean for almost nearly a decade, I can personally attest for this to be true. 
When I was recently attacked online and calls were made and emails were sent by white supremacists and they filled the voicemail boxes and the inboxes of the leadership of the institution that we currently now work, calling for my firing, Sean was the first amongst us to call me and say, are you okay? Is there anything that I can do? In fact, Sean has always been the first to defend me in public but also in private. It is he, perhaps more than anyone else, as a scholar in our field, who first gave me permission to use my scholarship to labor in the name of justice, to fight for freedom and liberation, not merely as philosophies, but as our ultimate reality. It was Sean who gave me an opportunity to sit at the table, not simply as his understudy and unlearned often in the difficult and problematic ways in which we must navigate this thing called academia, but as his intellectual partner and his equal. And so for the love that he has shown to me over the years and for the constant second chances he has provided me, I am forever indebted, humbled, and thanked, thankful. And so without further ado, allow me to introduce to some and perhaps present to others the generous and genuine, the prolific and profound, the indivisible and inimitable, Dr. Sean Harper, President of the Association for the Study of Higher Education. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Kanye. <laughs> and thanks to all of you for being here at the 42nd Annual Conference of the Association for the Study of Higher Education. For the next 35 minutes, I hope to use the power of this presidential platform to speak truth to power, to give permission to those of us who've long been powerless in the academy, and hopefully to ignite a paradigmatic shift in the study of higher education in ways that absolutely restores power to the people. Let me first begin by talking about and naming white power. Many of you saw this disturbing image out of the University of Virginia two months ago. Raise your hand if you were horrified and disgusted as you saw these and other images and heard the news out of Charlottesville. I went to UVA seven days after the crisis on their campus and in their town to be helpful. I asked the faculty and staff of that fine university the same question that I just asked you. Raise your hand if you are horrified and disgusted by the white supremacy that was on display here on your campus a week ago. By my account, every hand in the auditorium was raised. I said to them, colleagues, what I am going to say to you tonight, we cannot and we ought not be selectively disgusted by white supremacy. We must reject it in all its forms. See, white supremacy isn't just tiki torch carrying white nationalists marching on a college campus. There are other manifestations of white supremacy, of white power, the abuse of white power in academia. Dare I say, even in the study of higher education. How so, might you ask? There are at least four consistent and persistent manifestations and demonstrations of the abuse of white power and white supremacy in our field, at least four. One, I'm making note of in the book I'm writing for Johns Hopkins University Press, Race Matters in College. The first chapter of the book is titled, Born Racist. In it, I make very clear that higher education was racist and exclusive from the start. My people were enslaved as the idea of a college was imagined in our country. Native indigenous people 
were slaughtered as this idea of higher education in the U.S. was systematized and conceived. So I argue in the book, and I'm going to argue to you tonight, that one consistent manif manifestation of white power is architectural, meaning that white people determine what a university is, what its culture will be, how it, be, how it will be arranged, led, governed, and organized. People of color had no say in the architectural groundwork that was laid for colleges and universities in the US. That, I argue tonight, permanently wove white power and white supremacy into the places at which we work and certainly the places that we study. Another is compositional. Ours remains a largely white, overwhelmingly white profession. Overall, in universities, and even in our very loving and inclusive and caring, social justice-minded field of higher education, we're still overwhelmingly white. Given the compositional realities of our faculties, it is white people who get to determine who gains access as a student, as a faculty colleague, White people determine how many of us are let in. We don't usually have a say in how many of us we're going to let in. It's mostly white faculty members who determine the metrics of deservingness to have a seat at the table. Curricular manifestations of white supremacy. See, it's the largely, mostly, overwhelmingly white faculty that comprise our field who determine what is worthy of being taught and learned, whose voices, epistemologies, and histories are worthy of substantive, meaningful, deep integration into the curriculum. It's not me, it's not Lori Patton Davis. It's mostly white people who get to determine that. And dare I say that it's also editorial. I need not remind you that the leading journals in our field are led and edited by white people. They work hard. They're good citizens of our field. They're smart people. But they're also really powerful. They have a lot of power. The power to determine relevance, rigor, and what is publishable. They, along with their mostly white editorial boards, have editorial power. The playing of Kanye at the beginning wasn't entirely random. You know, Kanye argued that no one man should have all that power. I want to argue that no one racial group should have this much power and this much of a stronghold on a field of study, on an enterprise that's called the university. I just made a quick mention of my best friend, Lori Patton Davis, who's Ash president-elect. Um, Lori and I were in the same cohort in our graduate studies at Indiana University, and she has been my ride or die friend and academic partner for nearly two decades. I'm indebted to Lori for her great friendship, and I'm so excited for the start of her presidency and the end of mine on uh, Saturday <laughs> afternoon. You know, the things uh, for which I am indebted to Lori are too numerous to, to list and name in the time that we have remaining. But Lori gifted me an introduction to critical race theory. It is because of Lori that I 
became a student of critical race scholarship. She knew it first, then she had the power to share it with me. In her sharing, there was one piece in particular that just blew my mind. And this Cheryl Harris's piece on the property of white. The ideas that I just shared with you, these four, there are many more, by the way, but these four are very much shaped by Harris's piece about whiteness as property. It's white people who get to decide who's included, who's excluded, what matters, what doesn't matter. Harris so masterfully argues in the piece that Laurie introduced me to. You know, that piece had me thinking about a project that I took on many years ago. In many ways, it was a project of decolonizing the higher education canon. White people in our field have the power to exclude and to socialize. I'm gonna come back to the socialization piece in a moment. Let's talk about the exclusion piece. Student services, a handbook for the profession was assigned to me in the very first higher education course I took at Indiana University as a master's student. The book was touted as the Bible of our field. It is the book, I and my classmates were told, that has chapters that are written by the most influential and the most important scholars in student affairs in higher education. Charles told you my government name, and he also told you that I went to a historically black university. So as a first semester master's student at a predominantly white university coming straight from an undergraduate institution that was historically black, hearing that this is the book with the most important people in it, naturally my, my first question was, well, how many of them are black? Let me be very clear. This book has a nickname, The Green Book. Every edition of it has a cover with green. The book may be green, but it is the property of whites. And I made it my project to disrupt the white supremacy that had been evidenced in the four editions that preceded mine. There was no way I was going to sit in my powerful platform at that time at the University of Pennsylvania and be a part of a book project that excluded my people. I wanted to give power to my people to privilege their voices, our voices, to affirm our intellect, our right to belong, and to be included. I had that power, and I used it in this way. Thank me later. <laughs> Shall we talk about socialization? I'm not gonna talk to you all night about white power. I think you get it. But let's do talk for a moment about socialization, actually. A mostly white faculty that was taught by a mostly white faculty pass on certain norms and expectations and assumptions and patterns, right? We call it graduate student socialization and the socialization of early career scholars in our field. Again, it is a mostly white, almost entirely white faculty who set the norms. I want to argue here tonight that those socialization norms have a hypnotizing effect on people of color, especially in the academy.
oh, that's not scholarly writing. That's too narrow. Oh, nobody's gonna really care about Asian American and Pacific Islander students. You have to broaden your questions. Oh, that's too activist. Too flashy. You're too loud. Be objective. There is a such thing as objectivity. Don't waste your time being engaged with your people. That's not gonna count for tenure. You need to be in your office writing your papers. I want to use the power of this platform <laughs> to give those of us who have been hypnotized in this way permission to get out. To be, to be clear, don't get out of the academy. We need you in the academy. But we need you to be woke. We need you to be critically conscious. We need you to be responsible to the people you represent, the people whose livelihoods depend on your findings, on your action, on your advocacy for them. Get out. You have the power to get out. If someone suggests to you when you return back to your institutions that no, you don't have such power, you might simply respond to them in the following way. The secretary, the judiciary. Reclaiming my time. Okay. Reclaiming Matter of fact, my time. The secretary, the judiciary. Reclaiming my time. Okay. Reclaiming Matter of fact. Let's do talk for a moment about reclamation. Reclaim the time that you have lost writing pointless papers for the mere sake of presentation at a national conference, publication in a journal another line on your CV, reclaim your time. I am also giving you permission to reclaim your purpose, the purpose that brought you into this here academy. I couldn't resist. Okay, so another Kanye here. So here, here's a line from the song that I made you listen to, Power. In the lyrics, Kanye says the system's broken, the school's closed, the prison's open. We ain't got nothing to lose. We rolling. Many of you came to the study of higher education because you recognized that the system was broken. Because you were personally and firsthandedly disadvantaged by that system. I'm gonna say a little bit more in a moment. But let me just talk for a minute about reclaiming purpose. Perhaps one of the most extraordinary experiences of my decade at Penn was creating a grad prep academy that identified black undergraduate men in their junior year of college and to introduce them to higher education, research, education policy, research, research in ed psych. So in other words, introduce them to scholarly career opportunities in the field of education. Men 
who were a part of this experience, went on to pursue PhDs at UCLA, University of Michigan, University of Wisconsin-Madison, Duke, Northwestern, Harvard, Penn. Two of them are now tenure track assistant professors. Dimitri Morgan at Loyola University Chicago and Chauncey Smith at the University of Virginia who were both in our inaugural cohort of Grad Prep Academy Scholars. Charles and I and Keon McGuire and others who were with us at Penn at the time socialized these men to ask important people-centric questions that were responsible and responsive to our people. What's striking to me, now that we've done four cohorts of these Grad Prep Academy scholars, this is a picture of the most recent cohort. We've expanded it to include Latino, Asian American, and Pacific Islander, and Native American men, as well as black men. We brought them to Penn last year, 34 of them. There are things that they write in their application essays that are really striking to me. They say things like, I am interested in getting a PhD and becoming a professor because I saw the effects of attending schools in a district where funding wasn't as abundant as, the more, as its more affluent counterparts. This inspired these men to pursue PhDs. Similarly, every year when we sit at the table to do doctoral admissions, I read application statements from very talented, very inspired young people mostly, sometimes some older applicants, but young people mostly, who say, I want to pursue a PhD at Penn and or now at University of Southern California because I want to do something for the people. I want to make a difference in policy. I want to make a difference in practice. My people were suffering. People will often write in an introductory paragraph examples of disadvantage, structural disadvantage, systemic racism, and so on. And they say, this is why I would like to pursue a PhD. Somehow or another, they end up here at ASH like a year or two later presenting papers that have absolutely nothing to do with the kinds of things that they articulated in their purpose statements. It's called the statement of purpose. I'm going to uh, strongly encourage that we reclaim our purpose. You know, let me not be hypocritical here. I want to introduce you to Willa Mae Williams my mama's aunt. In many ways, she very much was like a great-grandmother kind of figure to me. Willa Mae Williams was a truth teller. She ain't throw shade. She ain't have to throw shade. She's just gonna give it to you just like it is. I will never forget a pivotal moment in my development as a scholar. In my doctoral program, I had gone home for a holiday break. Then I went to go visit my mama's aunt. And she asked me in a very loving, supportive way, she was so proud of me. She said, now, you, you are learning to study things. You're studying things, yes? And I said, yeah. And she was like, well, what is it that you're studying? So I told her. Her response to me was, you have to go to school for that? I could have told you that. I didn't even go to school. Now, it might sound like Willa Mae was discouraging me or being unsupportive. It was exactly the opposite. She was encouraging me to ask more critical and more important questions. I won't say what the topic of the paper was that I was writing because I swear to God, there is someone presenting a paper here at least as the title would suggest, is about the same thing that Willa Mae told me was just like absolutely just like not important uh, many years ago. So for that reason, I won't tell you what the topic was. What I will encourage you to do instead, 
I ain't gonna check you. I want you to check yourselves. I want you to ask yourself, what would Willa May say about this here paper that I have spent all this time writing? What would she say about these little methods that I've done to write this little paper that ultimately ain't gonna do nothing to deliver the people? What will Willa May say about you misusing the power of the platforms to which you've been afforded access? Terrell Strayhorn, one of the most important members of our community and one of the most important scholars in the study of higher education, gave a riveting keynote address last night. And he so generously lent me this, this image from his keynote. In his keynote last night, Terrell encouraged those of us at the CEP business meeting to remember this house. When Terrell put up this image, I couldn't help but think about Willa May, my mama's aunt. I don't have a picture of her house, but it looked a lot like this. Willa May was poor, like the rest of my family. She was also disadvantaged by structural and systemic racism. She was taken advantage of by banks in our town who preyed on her financial illiteracy. This house looks like Willa May's house. There is no way in hell I can sit in my office on the 11th floor of Wake Phillips Hall at the University of Southern California and write stupid, pointless, unimportant papers when there are people who live in houses like this, when there are people who are systemically and structurally disadvantaged like my people are. I have too much power to do that. What I, what I think I'm calling for here tonight, uh, I want us to focus on people, not pointless studies. The what will Willa May say metric has to be about the people. The people need power to be more equitably distributed. The people need and deserve justice. The people demand respect and deserve opportunity. Could we do a better job to the people? Could we do a better job upholding our commitment to the statement of purpose that brought us to the study of higher education? I, in this last segment of my speech, am going to talk about consequential questions we live in consequential times. Consequential times, dear colleague researchers, call for consequential questions. It's time out for the stupid pointlessness. The world is on fire right now in lots of ways. The world need us, needs us to ask better questions, to do better by the people. DACA is under attack. We have people in our association who are doing really important and critical work on DACA. It's one fine example of what I wish others of us would do in service to the people. A month ago, I informed the Ash Board of Directors that one of my final tasks and responsibilities to the association and to our field as president will be to establish a presidential commission on DACA and undocumented Americans. Fortunately, six leading scholars who study DACA and related immigration policies and write about undocumented people have generously accepted my invitation to be a part of this presidential commission. They will advise the ASH board
They will advise the ASH board and provide guidance to the rest of us on ways that we as higher education researchers might be more responsible to undocumented peoples. This morning, in the last board meeting of my presidency, the ASH Board of Directors unanimously adopted a statement that reads, as college and university faculty members and researchers, we write in support of the preservation of deferred action for childhood arrivals, immigration policies. Foremost, we urge lawmakers to respect the humanity of immigrants, their people, and their family members, including those who are and are not enrolled in institutions of higher education. Secondly, we call on lawmakers to appreciate and utilize the vast body of evidence that consistently confirms DACA recipients' accomplishments and their contributions to local, state, and national economies. Research makes painstakingly clear that ending DACA would diminish the livelihood of those protected under this policy and negatively affect our nation's workforce. Social science research findings, not unfounded or exaggerated assumptions about undocumented Americans, must guide policymaking at all levels. We, the undersigned, all highly value evidence affirming legal protections for this population. We insist that policy actors at federal, state, lo and local, and institutional levels do the same. This statement will be sent to the President of the United States, every member of the United States Senate and House of Representatives, and all 50 governors across the nation. The first signatories The first people to sign this statement this morning, immediately after we adopted it, were the members of the ASH Board of Directors. You may have gotten an email from the ASH office uh, within the past hour or so inviting you to be signatories on this statement. We also invite you to share it with your faculty colleagues in your schools of education and across your universities. It's not just for folks who work in, in, in ad schools. Uh, please share the link and invite our other colleagues to sign on to this important statement. This is one way that we're using our power as researchers to impact policy. It seemed like a real opportunity for me in my presidency to use the little power that I have to ignite what I hope is a paradigmatic shift. To help our field ask more people-centric, more people-informed questions in our scholarship. To do this, I invited 30 colleagues to join me in a presidential symposium series that we call We the People. In some ways, let me be, let me channel some of my South Georgia countryness for a minute. I think Nellie called it country grammar. When I came up with the title for this series, it really was sort of slang for we the people that y'all be writing about and making decontextualized claims and offering policy prescriptions and we the people that y'all write about but don't really talk to, we the people that we only see when you want us to fill out a survey or participate in one of your focus groups. We the people. So I've asked these 30 colleagues, including the members of the inaugural uh, Presidential Commission on DACA, to lead We the People uh, Presidential Symposia. In these symposia, these colleagues of ours are first taking stock of what has been written and what we know about each of these populations of peoples. They've been engaged with each other, by the way, uh, since July in this task. Right? Part of my instruction to them was also, in addition to stock taking, to reach some sort of agreement about questions that are in need of retirement, questions that have been beat to death, questions that will no longer do anything to deliver 
or improve the lives, educational outcomes, and experiences of the people. Then I asked them and invited them to imagine a new set of researchable questions that are not pointless, that are relevant, timely, and useful. They will be leading these symposia throughout the conference. After the conference, I'm inviting them to write, to write up together this new research agenda on each of these populations. We fully intend to have those research agendas, whatever they write, peer reviewed. But they'll be peer reviewed by the people. And the people will say, yeah, you got that right. Uh, nah, you ain't got this part right. Or here's the thing that you missed. Here's another aspect of our lives and experiences and realities that you know, might not be well understood by those of you who want to partner with us and who want to help improve our circumstances. It seems foolish of us as scholars to think we know it all without input and insight from the people. So these uh, seven presidential symposia, one is on DACA and undocumented peoples, another is on HBCU presidents and senior leaders uh, at historically black universities. That one happened this afternoon. It actually included two presidents of HBCUs. Imagine that. Presidents of HBCUs being engaged in an agenda setting exercise about what we should be thinking about and studying concerning HBCU leadership. Wow, that's like so mind blowing, huh? Muslims and peoples from faiths underrepresented on college campuses, low-income students attending low-resource public high schools, people who are incarcerated and those who were formerly incarcerated, community college students, and trans and gender queer teens and college students. I will be leading that panel tomorrow. I will be joined by seven trans and gender queer students from local Houston colleges and universities, as well as one teenager who, before she accepted my invitation, said that she needed to check with her mom uh, to make sure that it was okay for her to miss school to come and be with us tomorrow. She sent me an email today saying that my mom gave me the free and clear, I'll be there tomorrow morning. This particular symposium will also include an advocate who has worked for two decades with trans students, trans teens, and young adults here in Houston, mostly around issues of homelessness, bullying and abuse, and other critical issues. It would seem to me that if we are going to set an agenda, that somebody like that ought to be an informant of that agenda. Will the 30 people who are in the audience who are part of these We the People presidential symposia teams uh, please stand for a moment. <laughs> Our field will be long indebted to you for your intellectual leadership and your partnership with the people to help us ask more important, timely questions. I thank you, our field thanks you, and the people thank you. Willa May, smiling from heaven, thanks you for, for setting agendas that are really going to deliver the people. Let me just close with some reflections on what it means to live and labor in consequential times. My parents both are very religious. In fact, my dad is a pastor. My parents would be very disappointed to know that the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning it really should be to thank the Lord for waking me up 
allowing me to see another day, allowing me to do the work I do, using me as a vessel to deliver the people, to partner with the people, to empower and inspire the people. But instead, the first thing I do in the morning is read my Inside Higher Ed. I love it, it's my favorite. It's so useful. You know, there was a piece in Inside Higher Ed back in September, a September of racist incidents, in which there was just this long cataloging of one racist incident after the other on college campuses across the country, one after the other. You mean to tell me that these kinds of things are happening on college campuses and we sitting up in our offices asking pointless questions? I could imagine that the people at Montgomery Community College wishes that we could do more in our research to help them first understand and then effectively respond to racism, like the tweet that went viral, made national news, in which a white student with a Confederate flag that a black person took down, tweeted, you know, the nigger who tore down my Confederate flag, you're gonna be white man's property, or you see the tweet, it's there. This happened on a college campus. On a college campus where my friend Kenny works, last week or the week before, a white student whose roommates were a black student rubbed her bloody tampons on the belongings of the black student, stuck the black student's toothbrush inside her private parts, attempted to poison the student by putting moldy things in the student's food. And we up here presenting pointless papers. Yeah, so the Washington Post uh, reported earlier this week that there are these flyers being put up on campuses all across the country that say it's okay to be white. You know, let me be, let me be clear about this. It is okay to be white. It's absolutely okay. I don't know that white people need me to give them permission um, <laughs> or affirmation in that way, but it is okay to be white. It is not okay to be racist. It is not okay to advance and sustain white supremacy. It is absolutely not okay to misuse one's white power. I wish that we could do something around that. Now, some of you might be like, look, this guy wants us all to take on race questions. You know, like, nope, that's not it. I am just using these examples I mean, I direct a race and equity center, so these would be the examples that I use. Um, these are just some examples. But let me give you just a handful of others uh, in our final moments here. Can we do something more about gun violence and campus shootings? If you're looking for research ideas, this would be a great one. There are people literally dying on college campuses, and we here in Houston presenting point, pointless papers. Umpqua Community College. There was an Asian American woman there who laid face down in a pool of blood. She said that she tried to climb back on the chair and then she was shot, referring to another classmate. And the classmate fell, fell face down right in front of her. This Asian American woman said, I'm probably going to die. That's what she thought and felt in the moment. She pretended to be dead. Back when I was at Penn State, there was a woman in my class who was visibly panicked during class one day. And she said to me at the break, there's something going on at Virginia Tech. My sister attends Virginia Tech. I can't get in touch with her. 
would it be okay? Sorry, I, 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 need, to, I need to have my phone out. I need to, I need to check my phone during, during class. I, is that okay? This is when students used to ask for permission to use their cell phones in class. <laughs> what a time. She was panicked. So we, we all spent the rest of class watching the live breaking news about the massacre at Virginia Tech. There was a shooting at UCLA in 2016. My role model, Walter Allen, works at UCLA. My friend, Mitch Chang, works at UCLA. Linda Sachs is my friend. She works at UCLA. I asked Linda, what were you thinking and feeling when the shooting was happening on your campus? Linda said it's a paralyzing sensation to feel like you are running for your life, but not sure exactly where you should go. Might these be things like protocols and things that we like study and then like try to offer like some policy guidance for institutions that find themselves in the midst of these crises? That sounds and feels important to me. Yeah, you know, I had my own brush with this the day after the massacre in Las Vegas. My colleague, Natasha, ran through our office suite and she said, something's going on outside. There were helicopters, we work in a very tall building. There were helicopters swirling our building. We ran into Natasha's office and we looked out the window and it was like ghost town on the campus, on one side. On the other, we saw students running in the hundreds into the USC village where many of them live. I sent a text message to my mother that said there's an active shooter on campus, I'm safe, locked in my office, I'll keep you posted, please pray, I love you. There has to be something that an association of super smart people who care about higher education can do about this issue. It has to be. If this one doesn't move you, then how about this one? Sexual harassment doesn't just happen in Hollywood, Harvey Weinstein and Bill Cosby. It also happens in higher education. Charles Davis and I have heard the most horrifying, heartbreaking, disgusting stories of sexual harassment and sexual assault in our climate studies with women, white women, and women of color alike. Shouldn't we, we could use some help, actually, with that. Yep, help us, please take that on. There are women across our nation who would gladly and gratefully appreciate your your hard work on this. Yeah, more on sexual harassment and sexual assault, please. Listen, let me, let me just close here by talking about uh, the power of usable knowledge. Ours is an applied field. Cancer researchers research things because they want to find a cure for cancer. They want to find treatments, effective treatments for cancers. That's why they do cancer research. They absolutely don't do cancer research just to get some papers published, just to get another line on their CV, just to be seen at their annual conference. Those people are in search of a cure. Engineers research things because they want to improve infrastructures and deficiencies. They want to build things that are sound, that are safe, that make our lives better. That's why they do research. Charles mentioned to you that I'm now also a professor of business, and I can tell you right now that I know for sure that business school professors do research to help businesses become more profitable and more efficient. That's why they do research in these other applied fields. Were she alive today, Willa May would ask you 
Well, why do you do research? What problem are you trying to solve? How are you trying to make our world better? What are you doing in service to the people? Knowledge on its own is not power. We have power. Yeah, this theme meant so much to me that I tattooed on my body, uh, on my wrist here, the N equals people. It is a constant reminder that there are populations of people, big Ns, who depend on what I do in my samples with people, small Ns. This is a daily reminder to me that I am to use these hands and, the, and this mind in service to the people. In sum, my friends and colleagues, I hope that I have empowered you to wake up, to get out, to ask more critical questions in these critical times, Please, fight the power and power to the people.